Tassa, Bado, Ato, Arahato, Summa, Sumbudasa. Namo Tassa, Bago, Ato, Arahato, Summa, Sumbudasa. Budang, Dhammang, Sangang, Namasami. So that's a traditional request for Odama talk and a homage to the Triple Gem. It's a way to begin every teaching and practice interaction with a reference and remembering of what's most important. So these last few weeks, uh, with the exception of the wonderful exception of last weekend when we had Ayananda Bodhi here, which was one really, really great and a blessing. We've been speaking about the hindrances, the nivarana, and when the Buddha spoke about the defilements of the mind, he often spoke in terms of three root uh, kilesa, greed, hatred, and delusion. Greed and hatred being the arms of delusion. But in our day-to-day -day lives, he categorized the hindrances to mental calm in five very uh, easy to see blocks or obstacles to singleness of mind or unification. So these are uh, kamachanda, sensual desire, which the Buddha compared to being in debt or a bowl of water mixed with dye so that one could not see one's face clearly and sacred texts long known to one would remain unclear. Vayapada, aversion or ill will, which the Buddha compared to illness or a bowl of water heated over fire until it bubbled and one could not see one's face and sacred texts one long known to one remained unclear. Tinamita, uh, sloth and torpor, which the Buddha compared to a dungeon or a bowl of water covered in algae so that one could not see one's face and sacred words long known to one remained unclear. Udacca restlessness and remorse, uh, which the Buddha compared to slavery or a bowl of water set, a bowl of water ruffled by the wind so that one could not see one's face and sacred texts long known to one remained unclear. And finally, vichagicha or skeptical doubt which the Buddha compared to uh, a caravan passing through a bandit-infested wilderness or a bowl of water set in dark, stirred up and muddied so that one could not see one's face and sacred texts long known to one remained unclear. And the unified mind of calm, absent all these hindrances, the Buddha compared to freedom from debt, freedom from illness, freedom, uh, release from slavery, safe passage, or a bowl of water, clear, limpid, so that one could see one's face and even sacred texts just learned would be clear. So we've spoken about the first three, sensual desire, anger, and uh, sloth and torpor. This fourth, udacca kukucha, which is the most fun of all of them to say, is variously translated as restlessness and remorse, hurry and flurry, which has the benefit of rhyming a bit like the original Pali. But what it can be looked at is the tendency for the mind to go backwards in time or forwards. Restlessness or anxiety about the future and remorse over the past. This is our departure from the present moment, which is all there ever is, into a uh, an unreal landscape of past and future. And this is where most of us spend our time. Where the other uh, hindrances are rooted in greed and aversion, or many of them are, um, utacca kukucha, uh, restlessness and remorse, anxiety and remorse, is rooted in delusion. Because it 
involves the mind dwelling on what is not real. And both a self-flagellating remorse and a neurotic anxiety are, I think, quintessentially modern pastimes seem to indulge in a great deal. And it would be easy to skip over or move past this hindrance uh, lightly and to simply point out how it's the mind in its unsettled state. Um, Utacha Kukucha kind of has the connotation of hovering over and miss the fact that remorse is one of the most prominent forms and threads of suffering that we carry with us through our lives. So how do we work with this? The Buddha prescribed a few different means. Um, in the commentaries, the cure to Uttacca Kukucha is simply returning to the breath, the simple in and out of the uh, wind in the body or the energy. But for a malady which affects us so deeply and sometimes comes in far uh, more scarring ways, we have to have a tool belt of what the Buddha termed upaya or skillful means to deal with it. So with deep remorse over the past, those memories of what one has done, done that dog one uh, meditation after meditation or year after year. Um, a really appropriate way uh, to deal with them is first to acknowledge the first noble truth in them of suffering. Just let yourself feel the pain of what had been done. Um, just say, ow. And then there's another point where one surrenders that um, pain and brokenness to whatever one holds highest, the spiritual aspiration or the Buddha. And uh, the Buddha conceptualized, if you'd like, as the quality of knowing and transcendent potential for the human heart. And give it to the Buddha and actually bow. Um, the full-length prostrations used by the Tibetans can be really useful in this connotation. A few years ago, I talked about uh, cleaning a shrine and accidentally knocking a Guanyin statue off so that her head broke off, and then ended up doing a lot of full-length prostrations that night. So this is useful. Then one makes the determination not to do it again, and then one acknowledges that, to some extent, this is the imperfection of samsara. It's impossible to mop to perfect cleanliness the floor we stand on, or to sweep to perfect smoothness, the sand we, uh, we stand on. And this acknowledgement of brokenness is sometimes the proper course, is really leaning into that wind of guilt and just saying, yeah, I'm, I'm guilty. Um, not held in an unwholesome way, but just acknowledging that we are human. And uh, this humanity is what binds us Remembering how the Buddha received even those who had scarred themselves deeply and done terrible things, the equanimity and kindness. Uh, King Achitasattu, one of the Buddha's, uh, the son of one of the Buddha's main disciples, King Bimbisara. King Bimbisara was a stream enterer, a uh, practitioner, an, a wonderful king, and his son, King Achitasattu, uh, killed him to take power. And later on in his life, King Achitasattu comes to the Buddha and speaks to him. And the Buddha receives him and teaches him. And at the end of the session, King Achitasattu says, I've done something wrong. Um, I killed my father, a good man. And the Buddha says, one who acknowledges a fault as a fault grows in the discipline of the noble ones. So it is growth in the discipline of the noble ones to see what one has done and not to dwell on it. Um, the Buddha has another sutta where he speaks about dwelling on misdeeds done in an unwholesome way, being 
cause for rebirth in hell, um, even in this life, uh, that mind state, and I think we all know it, of running over again and again those things we've done in an unwholesome way. So there's a sutta called the conch blower, where the Buddha says, just as a conch blower makes themselves heard in the four directions, even so, when one develops loving kindness, metta, uh, compassion, sympathetic joy, mudita, gladness, upekka, equanimity, even so, any limited kama does not remain. And he said another uh, analogy, which many of you might know, where he said that when a bad deed comes to fruition within the narrow mind, it is like a pinch of salt dropped into a glass of water, and it changes the flavor of the water completely. Even so, the fruits of a bad deed in the limited mind come to fruition quickly and in dire ways. The fruits of bad karma in the broad mind, boundless with loving kindness, are like a pinch of salt dropped into the Ganges, and there's hardly a change of taste at all. Even so, the fruits of bad deeds done when manifest in the broad heart imbued with loving kindness, hardly manifest. So, that's good news for us. The result, present experience, is the result of past karma, present intention, and the results of present intention all mixed together. And what this means is that, yes, we have our past, but our present mind state and heart genuinely affect the results of that karma. And there really comes a point on the practice where when you slip up, because you will, there's an ability, a lightness, a resilience, a humor, where you're able to say, ow, okay, that wasn't my best, and you move on. And this is the pinch of salt in the Ganges. Of course, eventually, um, you know, the present experience being the result of past karma, present intention, and results of present intention leads to a chaotic system. And one feature of chaotic systems is something called resonant points, resonance points, where the equations uh, depicting them divide by zero and the whole thing breaks down. And that's Nibbana. Uh, Ajahn Jeff has a great essay called Nibbana equals samsara divided by zero. So there does come a point we could never use our past comma ever. There's too much. But we don't have to. So these are useful tools to deal with remorse. Other important things are when something's really bad. Um, sometimes using a ritual, acknowledging it through ritual are important, and grieving through ritual. There's a story of a man who, as a boy, was forced by his father to take a bunch of dogs out back and put them down, shoot them. And they haunted him for years. And so what I think it was Jack Cornfield had him do was instead of sitting the meditation retreat, he went out into the woods and created uh, piles of stones for each of them under the constellation of Sirius. And whether it's lighting a candle or doing some sort of ritual, there's an embodied power and a container for suffering found in ritual. And some griefs and some remorse need such a container and such acknowledgement. So use that. Another skillful means is uh, confession, and psychological literature backs this up quite, quite effectively. But it's something that the monks and bhikkhunis do, is every two weeks we get together and you bow to your companion in the holy life and you confess those places you've slipped, and often you can rejoice in those things you've done that were good. And uh, this can be alternately embarrassing and um, interesting, informative, but it is always useful. And it's not some esoteric purification. It's just the chance to tell someone 
start anew, hold yourself accountable. So uh, if any of you are interested, we've started to encourage uh, confession buddies. I think we're calling confession confidants. And if uh, you join um, our Discord group, we have all the instructions there for how to do that every two weeks. And we really encourage people to buddy up and have a confession friend. Finally, most of our, most, our greatest slips and our cons- uh, persistent patterns of damage come from parts of ourselves which were created, sankaras we call them, programs. Sankara is the Pali word were created for our own survival when we were young. And, you know, this could be the fact that you are shy and quiet to a fault because the parent you lived with was angry much of the time and the only way you could get by was by being silent or any other such pattern and these patterns exist and continue into our adult lives and so often they dictate the harmful actions we continue to do and so instead of berating yourself for what was done or for this pattern coming up again can you imagine that warm room or field of metta invite in that part of yourself that child for tea or coffee, whatever. And can you say, thank you for saving me, for helping me. And I have a better way now. Um, I don't need you in the same way I did, but thank you. This is understanding conditionality, the conditions that gave rise to our actions. And so often, if you look back with genuine perspective, you can understand how you would have slipped in all the ways you did. You know, whether it be... uh, grabbing a few dollars from the till in the coffee shop you worked at, or, you know, the not-so-beautiful breakup. Who, who here has had one of those? Um, and the, all these things, we didn't know better. And we're all the blind stumbling into the blind. The arahants are the only noble ones. The rest of us are kind of clumsy children together. And that's all right, but to acknowledge that and to see that settling of the heart when it acknowledges conditionality. This is why that happened. How could it have been otherwise? I didn't know. And that exhalation of release. And then finally, the Buddha talks about the gratification triad, which is seeing the draw of something, its drawback, and the escape. So we know the drawback of remorse. We know its pain. But why, what's the draw? Why do we keep doing it? Until we comprehend that, we cannot put it down. And the draw of remorse often comes from a misplaced belief that that's the only way we will be perfect. That we can control this from happening again. And there's also, we orient ourselves by our suffering. And there's a comforting feel to that whip of words on ourself that we are very familiar with. Whether it's pleasant or not, it's familiar. So what draws us back again and again to that situation of what the Buddha termed slavery? And obviously, a white man in today's society, I have to be a bit careful using that word, but this is the Buddha's analogy here. The other uh, aspect the Buddha brought up here was anxiety about the future. And it's a similar movement of the heart and mind, but into the future. And what can be useful to recollect here is that never has a problem been solved by this sort of anxiety. A conscious and logical planning for what is to come is not utta chikukucha. This is the running around in circles about what could happen again and again, like gnawing on an old bone. And it's useful to recollect here that uh, not only is it 
not helpful and that whatever situation is to come will be best served by us developing mindfulness, awakening, loving kindness in the present moment by really dedicating ourselves to our meditation or the situation we find ourselves in now. But also that the anxiety over the future um, is sometimes best put to rest by an internalized external voice. So I think I've mentioned, Ajahn Kobe Lo and I have a saying called WWLPPD, what would Long Pasano do? And most of us have that one person in our lives who you can kind of bring to mind and say, what would they say to do? And they'll have a pretty quick answer for you. But another thing to recognize is that the quality of these hindrances is a restlessness. And if there's a debate about what to do into the future, or an anxiety or a fear, you know, or say this feeds a little bit into doubt, but it's a similar landscape, um, to whether to do something or to not do it, or whether to take the reserve parking spot or to not, or whether to use the friend's subscription to Netflix or to not, think about what if you can't stop debating the issue, then best not to do it because this is all for the sake of calm. That's your answer. There's no need to debate about it. We are giving ourselves to calm. So if one answer on that question leads to a settling, that's your answer. Um, the other useful techniques are to sleep on things. I frequently ask myself questions I'm unsure about right when I wake up. Um, and yet the solution to all these hindrances, or to Utajikagucha, is sukha, happiness, and pleasure. And in meditation, this is how we cultivate the antidote to restlessness and remorse, is coming back to the breath, and specifically learning to cultivate a wide field of awareness because you'll notice that before the mind can travel off into the past and future, it has to shrink itself as if it's traveling through a tunnel. So often, if you manage to cultivate this wide field of the body, drop awareness into the torso, and then yes, you can come to a refined point of awareness on, say, the nose or the belly and follow the breath there but always in the periphery have a wide field of awareness. Something that can help with this is that when the mind comes to calm, instead of letting it settle right at the nose or the belly, keep both the tailbone and the top of the head, both in your mind at the same time, the cord of the vertebrae, a string, uh, past which that breath moves. It can sound like a lot to keep in your head at a time, but just sort of use both of those points to expand that field, and you find that you won't be able to move back or forward into time. And finally, ekagata, which means unification of mind, and is the fifth samadhi factor. In the sense of a life, can simply, or could simply, resonate with the idea of unification of purpose. And we underestimate this, the benefit of right view, purpose, and a path. So often we lament our inability to access jhana, to be the people we want to be. And we forget the poignancy and potency of this comma of the path. What it means to have a calling and an aspiration held above and beyond the goals that mundania, as one member here calls it, holds to us. And this, in some sense, is enough over time to steadily dissolve all the hindrances, including utachakukucha, restlessness. David Stundel Ross says, the cure to exhaustion is not rest but wholeheartedness. And I'd say the exact same thing applies to every single hindrance. 
so much of our restlessness, our wondering, is because our hearts know they have to give themselves to something and they haven't found the right thing to give it to. And this is why we come and gather and remember together what it means to be a human dedicated towards complete purification of heart, given a path, a tool belt, and skillful means to do so. And other friends and practitioners who genuinely understand and resonate with that aspiration. So even if the samadhi is not coming together as much as we would want, even if we can't follow our breath for too long, don't undervalue simply having this teaching in your heart, in your minds, and know that just carrying it on with integrity would be no small accomplishment in a life. And that's where we come together, leaf blowers, gym, radiators, and all uh, together. So I wish you all uh, the best in that. Okay, welcome back. I think we might have had some Zoom people in a breakout room with just themselves, so sorry, <laughs> not sure. Um, so I hope that was uh, okay. If people wanted to raise their hand now, um, in Zoom you can raise your electronic hand. And uh, yeah, if people wanna share some of the stuff that came up, that would be helpful to share or ask any questions that came up. We'll run a mic, we'll mindfully run a mic over to you. Juanita? And yeah, if you're on Zoom, please feel free to raise your electronic hand too. My remorse, um, when I was young, I'm the youngest in the family of the 10th, and I have the next to me, my sister who handicapped, but when we were young, we didn't know that she's handicapped. She's very slow. And she went to the first grade, to school the first grade. She, uh, and she, the second grade, she didn't, she didn't pass to the, the third one. So I catch up to her. And I thought, uh, why my sister is so, so stupid <laughs> and so slow? I didn't know because she's handicapped. And then we had to study the same class. And then my sister cannot add up the number normally. And the mathematics, we do the homework together. And then we study homework together, and I told her to add up this number, and she still cannot add up because she's very slow down. So I beat her. I very remember that. I kicked, I used the hand to kick her head. And then even now, when I still think about it, I feel very bad about it, very sad about it. But uh, after listening to Ajahn Jayasaru, he said, what you did in the past is not you now. So I said, OK, think of yourself as the person who did the wrong thing is your younger sister. I said, that's good. I don't have younger sister. I'm the last one in the family. So I said, OK. The one who did the bad thing to other people that time, to my older sister that time, is my younger sister. So if I, I love my younger sister, I have to forgive my younger sister. So I use that to practice to help me. It helped me a lot to, to forgive myself for did that. And then I, I use that to take a good care of my sister in the village now. So. That's my story of the Muslims. Thank you, Anita. Hello. Um, this is just a comment that I really appreciated um, when it comes to should I, shouldn't I do something, um, just feeling what is that sense of calm. And I was just in the group. Um, it sort of feels like if I have to like push a little, just even put a shoulder a little forward to make a decision to do something, it's probably not the decision that's going to lead to um, feeling um, 
yeah, it, it, anyways, that just that making the decision based on what feels calm. And also for me, I would just have this imagine where I'm just sort of pushing it. Um, if I step back and don't do that, it, I think uh, it'll save me some time in meditation <laughs> and not going in circles of like, why did I do that? Did I make a mistake? Um, you know, so that was just very helpful. Um, and because we make a lot of decisions throughout our days in the day, and um, sometimes we're moving really quickly, and it's helpful to remember to slow down and take a pause and think through a decision um because it could you know be around much longer than we think <laughs> when we're meditating <laughs> so thank you thanks allison there's a phrase when before a precept in the vinya the monastic code is broken often there's a phrase that says you crush the will not to do it and do it and that's when you know the precept has been broken is this aspect of crushing down the part of yourself that says don't do it. And I find that helpful in knowing if you've broken a precept, if you like really get in your head about like, oh gosh, like I was sweeping, some ants died. Like was there that sense of crushing the intention to not and just being like to hell with it. And then you know there has been a boundary cross, but also exactly like the Buddha says that just as all water in the ocean is one flavor so all teachings in the Dhamma have one flavor, that of liberation. And I just find that same, like, aiming towards peace has that same thing, so. I don't know if this is going to be helpful, but uh, can you offer a distinction between regret and remorse? Mm -hmm. The Buddha speaks about worldly and spiritual feelings and like worldly pleasant feeling is like uh, you know satisfaction of the senses world spiritual pleasant feeling is metta samadhi the blamelessness of sila worldly unpleasantness unpleasant feeling is like losing you know not being gratified by the senses spiritual unpleasant feeling uh they say is uh wholesome regret and desire to attain one's spiritual goals. So there is a place for acknowledging, like, like in the sutta, the Buddha says, um, uh, that one about the conch blower, he says, what is done is done, I can't undo it. But if I were to dwell on it, my mind would think something like become dark and suffering. Um, so there's that place of just like, okay, acknowledging and feeling and letting it echo. But I'd say most of us lean heavily on the, uh, most of us have plenty of that. <laughs> you know, it's, it's the great tragedy in modernity is the best people hurt themselves the most. And some people spend their whole lives in that small closet of suffering. And they're just such good people. It's, it's really sad. So yeah, there is a distinction. There is a place for knowing what was done is wrong, but there's very much a place for moving on. Go for it. Hey, Mary. Oh. Hello, everybody. Hello, Aja, and hello, Sangha, from the Zoom room. It's so good to be with you. And I don't have much to say about the regrets, but I do want to um, give my, I just love being able to have a breakout room and talk. It's very isolating to just attend from a distance mm -hmm. and miss the companionship, the spiritual companionship. So I really liked having a chance to have a breakout room conversation and would even be up for a coffee afterwards, you know, a Zoom coffee, a Zoom room coffee, because this is so much of the path and it's a wonderful sangha. So thank you for thinking of this, constantly creating um, sangha in many different ways. And I just really appreciated this chance. Thank you. I've got a hearty emoticon from Amy. So you're agreed with. Um, <laughs> yeah, so thank you, Mary. We will keep the Zoom room open and unmute everyone after this. Um, so you can all chat and have coffee together and Maybe we can have, even have people wander over and look at the webcam and wave to you. So, yeah, good.
Also, for those who want, you know, our Wednesday Zooms from 6.45 to 7.30 after the YouTube live stream get, they're really pretty intimate spaces. It's pretty wonderful. So everyone's welcome to join in then too. I think we have room for one more. Yeah, we talked about um, how moving from a um, self-centered focus to a uh, focus of serving others can help us, um, and it, it, it seems to kind of be in line with the concept of the non-self. And um, I've just noticed uh, personally that serving others is um, really helped me with uh, a lot of uh, regret and remorse mm. and, and helped me let go. Thank you, John, for pointing that out. Ajahn Tanisaro has a whole essay calling, called The Healing Power of the Precepts. And like the fact that we really are healing old wounds through this path 